The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, unit number five in the Lunch and Learn series. And uh, this is about managing team conflict and negotiation. So I hope you had a chance to complete your um, conflict resolution di uh, diagnostic because it'll give you a little bit of a clue as to how you like to deal with conflict. Um, I just want to make sure I'm being heard. So could I ask you, please, on the right hand side, if you could just click clear, that lets me know that I'm coming across loud and clear. So um, otherwise, uh, we've got some audio problems. So uh, anybody, any takers? Hopefully, I am coming across loud and clear, but I just may need to make sure. So just type in the word clear in the question box there, just on the right hand side. Thanks, John. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Genevieve. All right, it sounds like I am coming across loud and clear, which is great. So um, let's move on to the topic of managing team uh, conflict and negotiations. So what you can see on your screen there is a list of the topics that we've covered. You can see that, of course, we've got one more topic to cover, which, of course, is the developing of a team culture. You might recall two weeks ago in Unit 4, in fact, it was more than two weeks ago, it was before the, uh, the break, so Happy New Year to everybody. We had a very, guest, a very special guest speaker in Chris Burton talking about team roles, and he was using the team management profile, which I use extensively to talk about team roles. Um, so hopefully you found that useful, and I'll just debrief on that shortly. So um, let's get underway. The normal process is if you've got any questions or any comments or any observations, type them into the question box and I will deal with them the moment I see them. And that way we can uh, keep the process flowing and, uh, and not leave a sort of 10 minute pause at the end while people are thinking about their questions or comments. So that would be great. Okay. Now, Last time, you, your homework before Christmas was to observe your team, um, how they communicated, what were their preferences, consider using these preferences. So it was really about trying to understand how people in teams like to uh, or prefer to communicate. And we went through eight of those last time. So hopefully you've had a bit of fun with that. Certainly if you're interested, you can do the team management profiles, but you'll need to contact me uh, via email for that. And I can uh, certainly talk to you about that and give you a price for that process if you find that useful for, for your internal team. And last time we met, we talked about the team management profile and what you're seeing here is two teams and what the teams have, have done is we've plotted their profiles on the wheel, the wheel that Chris talked about last time. And you'll notice that um, this team here, which is a real life team, is very much skewed towards the right hand side of the wheel. So very much a producing and, uh, and organizing team and a little bit light on on the left hand side, which is more the reporting and the maintaining side of things. So the graph on the right hand side shows people's first preference and also their related preferences. And that's why it's more populated than the one on the left. And uh, of course, that's come from the team management profile that Chris talked about last time. Okay, so I hope you've had some fun with that and realize that it's really important, if possible, to try to capitalize on those preferences when you're working in team discussions and dialogue. So what are we going to cover during our session today? Well, we're going to look at political awareness. Uh, political awareness is an interesting topic because a lot of people say to me, at least, that I'm not very politically, you know, I'm not really interested in politics and I just get on with my job at work. The truth of the matter is there's politics going on everywhere all the time with all sorts of people. And for any team leader not to be aware of that 
puts themselves at a distinct disadvantage. So I'm going to share with you a model around uh, team or political awareness. I'm going to share with you the model, which is the Thomas Kilman model, which was the model that was the foundation of the questionnaire that I asked you to complete prior to today's session. So we'll just try and understand how that model works. Uh, we'll look at the different styles of dealing with conflict and when they're appropriate and not. And you'll find that uh, uh, sometimes uh, they, uh, they, um, they are useful and other times they're not. It really depends on the situation that you're in. And then we'll look at some case studies and finish up with that. And uh, I'll give you a chance to uh, give me some ideas about how you think you would deal with that particular case study. All right, so that'll take us through, and then we'll finish, of course, uh, at the top of the hour. So let's talk about political awareness, and let's just build up this particular chart so that you can see how it works. Um, the first thing is that we have a uh, horizontal axis, and on the left-hand side, we have people in organisations who are what we would refer to as game players, in other words, they're always scheming, they're always uh, looking to play the political game. And there are also people on the right hand side who pride themselves on acting with integrity. So that's the first continuum. So you might like to think, are you more a game player or are you more a person who likes to act with integrity? Now the other uh, axis, the vertical axis, has two dimensions to it. At the top, we have people who are generally politically aware. These are people who are aware of their political influence inside the team and outside the team as well, and also the politically aware of other people's influence as well. And we have people who are politically aware. So are you a person who would pride themselves on being politically aware? or would you pride yourself on being politically unaware? So basically we've got a typical two by two matrix here. And if we populate that matrix over on the top left hand corner, we have people who we would perhaps describe as clever. Um, so let's call that person a fox. These are people who are game players who are politically aware. So they are always playing games politically and they're also quite politically aware. So whilst they're quite clever and they can get away with a lot of things in the workplace, the reality is that everybody knows they're a fox. So they're on guard and aware, but because they're quite politically savvy, they can often get away with uh, things before people are aware of it. Hopefully you're not a fox. Then we have down on the bottom left hand corner, people who are what we might refer to as donkeys. These are people who are inept in the sense that they are game players, but they're politically unaware. In other words, they're on the take all the time, but they're not very good at it. And as a result of that, they're not terribly successful in terms of working in teams. All right, so hopefully you're not, not either a fox or a donkey. It's not a good place to be as a team leader. Now, which leaves two more. So let's look at the bottom right hand corner. These are what we might refer to as the innocent lambs. These are people who are politically unaware, who act with integrity. So they come to work, they do a good job, they keep their nose clean, they do what they can, and they basically will rationalise that I'm not interested in politics. I'm just here to do the job that I'm paid to do and the rest will take care of itself. Now, it's not wise for you to be uh, a lamb because the reality is if you're a team leader, you are in some way, shape or form involved in politics. The question is, uh, are you politically aware? Which is the last box where I'd strongly recommend that you be these are people who are wise, so we might call them owls, and these are people who are politically aware, who act with integrity. Now that's the place to be. So you act with integrity, what you say is what you mean, 
but you're also very sensitively aware and acutely aware of the fact that you're working in a political environment. Now, that's the place that I strongly recommend that you aim to be. Um, so it is possible to be politically aware and act with integrity. But of course, the further up you go up the ladder in terms of your own situation, the more difficult that becomes because, not because you become corrupt, but because decisions are not necessarily black and white, they're shades of grey. And because they're shades of grey, you find yourself put in very difficult positions uh, in different ways and uh, means. So, but being a team leader, you should be aiming to be politically aware and acting with integrity. So hopefully that makes sense to you. And I just wanted to share that with you because I think I get a lot of people saying to me, oh, look, I'm really not very interested in politics and I just come to work and do my job and the rest will take care of itself, which is slightly naive because the reality is politics is everywhere. Okay. So let's talk about the Thomas Kilman model. Now, the Thomas Kilman model has been around for quite a few years, and uh, obviously it was developed by Thomas and a fellow by the name of Kilman. And they came up with this very interesting uh, model. And what you're seeing on your screen is you're seeing two axes. One is assertiveness, and the other one is cooperativeness. So these are the two dimensions that we'll look at when we consider the five particular approaches. So if you've got your diagnostic and you've completed it, now would be the time to have a look at it to see where you fit in. Because on the diagnostic, what you would have ended up with is a score for each of these five that are in the green space. So let's start up in the top left-hand corner, competing. So when someone deals with conflict in a competing capacity, what they're actually doing is they're highly assertive because they're pushing their point, but they're also perhaps not terribly cooperative. In other words, this is what we call a win-lose situation. So the leader is trying to win at the expense of other people, and that's why we call it competing, and that's why it's low on cooperation. Now, there's a time and a place to be doing that, but if you had a relatively low score in competing, it probably suggests that you need to do more of that. And again, if you had a relatively high score, and you may say, what's a relatively low and what's a relatively high score? Two, one, or zero would be a relative low score, and a 10, nine, or eight would be a relatively high score. So if you scored a 10, nine, and an eight, it's probably true that you see the world in very much in terms of win-lose. Either you win, or you lose. And you see most conflict and negotiation situations as a win-lose situation. Now, if we go down to the bottom right-hand corner where you've got accommodating, accommodating is the exact opposite. This is actually lose-win. So it's high on cooperativeness and low on assertiveness. What do I mean by that? That means that in a conflict situation or a negotiation, there will be a tendency, if you've got a high score in this area, to let the other person win. So to keep the peace, for example, which is why it's high on cooperativeness, you will tend to let the other person win. Now, any of us in long-term relationships would understand that we need to accommodate. You can't, of course, win everything and in order to sustain the relationship, there, there is a need to occasionally give over to the other person. Not all the time, but sometimes. So have a look at your scores. If you have a relatively high score in accommodation, probably suggests that you're doing too much of it and you probably occasionally need to dig in. Then again, if you had a very low score in accommodation compared to your other four scores, it probably would suggest that you need to be doing, uh, you, you, you perhaps you need to occasionally let people win the battle so that you can win the war. So in other words, seeing a bigger picture. So that leaves three more in a, in a diagonal. So if we go to the bottom left-hand corner, uh, 
avoiding. So if you avoid in a conflict situation, avoiding is low on assertion and low on cooperativeness. Why? Because obviously if you're avoiding, you're not really engaging in the negotiation or the conflict at the time. So in these sorts of circumstances, you might buy yourself time to come back, let people calm down, or you might just delude yourself into believing it's not worthwhile getting involved. There is a time and a place to avoid. And again, if your scores are relatively high on this, it probably suggests that you are probably doing too much avoiding and you probably need to get involved earlier in a negotiation or a conflict. And I'll talk about the you know, times when you need to be um, using avoiding. So if we go up to the top right hand corner, you'll see collaboration. Now collaboration is high on assertion and high on cooperativeness. What does that actually mean? Well, when you collaborate with somebody, what you're actually doing is you're willing to work with and through them on the issues to come up with a resolution that you're both happy with. And that requires you being assertive, but it also requires you to be cooperative. So the, the, this is a problem solving approach to dealing with conflict. And you might, th you might think, well, surely that would be the best of the five approaches. Not necessarily. I mean, one of the big downfalls of collaboration is that it takes a long time because you've obviously got to have a conversation with the other person or persons in order to get to a situation where you can come up with a resolution. And we don't always have a lot of time to deal with situations of conflict. Now, if you had a relatively high score in collaboration, it probably suggests that you try too often to collaborate. And it may well be that the other person's not interested in collaborating with you. So if the other person's not interested in collaborating with you, then clearly you're wasting your time. So a relatively low score on collaboration would probably suggest that you could be doing more of that. Now, the middle one where is compromising is halfway in the middle of being assertive and halfway in the middle of being cooperative. Now, why is it in the middle? Well, when you compromise, what normally happens is that you give a little bit and the other person gives a little bit. So you meet halfway, so to speak. And because you meet halfway, um, you're willing to concede certain things. That's why it's not completely assertive. But on the other hand, you're willing to be reasonably cooperative. So buying a house is a classic example of compromising. So when you buy a house, normally the seller and the price that they want um, and the price that you're willing to pay, we, you have to meet somewhere in the middle. So there's a compromise that occurs when you purchase a house usually done through a real estate agent. So again, check your scores. If you had a high score on compromising compared with the other ones, it probably suggests that occasionally you should move to one of the other areas and maybe sometimes you'll get frustrated when you're trying to compromise with people who aren't willing to compromise. The other important thing to notice in this model is that what is the difference between your compromising score and your collaboration score? Because if your compromising score is relatively high compared with your collaboration score, it probably gives you a signal that you should, when you fail to compromise, so you can't meet someone halfway, you should then move into the collaboration mode. So what you should do then is just say, look, and a good question to ask the other person is, are you willing to work with me to see if we can resolve this in a situation where we're both happy or, or, or worse to that effect. Now, by doing that, it really puts the onus on the other person to indicate to you whether they're willing to collaborate. And of course, if they are, then you go ahead and you've got the time to do it. But if they're not, well, then obviously it's no point in going any further with that. So hopefully that's sort of explained that. Now, the important thing for you is when you look at your conflict diagnostic, you'll notice that your scores are different. Now, it's true to say that when you completed it, it would probably depend on the situation that you're in, which would determine which of those 
five things that you might have ticked in terms of the questions. That's very true. But all of us have a preferred style of dealing with conflict. And what the questionnaire is doing is giving you a, a really good insight into your own particular style, preferred style. Because the reality is that you're probably using that style too often. And because you're using it too often, you're probably finding that it's not as effective as it could be because not all situations are ideal for that particular style. So there are three variables involved in any conflict situation for a team leader. There's your own personal profile or style, which is of course your scores from on the, on the questionnaire. So in other words, you'll have a tendency to use the scores that are high and probably have a tendency not to use the scores that are low or at least the strategies where the scores are low. That's one variable. Another variable, of course, is who you're dealing with. So if it's a team member, they themselves have a profile. Of course, they may not have completed this profile, but they themselves see the world in terms of their preferred and uh, preferred styles. So uh, that's another variable. And the third variable, of course, is the situation that you're in. So, for example, if it's a health and safety or an emergency situation, then clearly the most relevant style because of the fact that you don't have much time is a competing style. All right. But um, in other circumstances where you have to work with another team to sort out a way of being able to deal with a situation, it might well be more inclined towards collaborating or compromising. So you can see your style, the other person's style and the situation you're in, they are all relevant. So it's really a question of um, looking at things. Now, the key thing is when we're dealing with conflict, we normally don't start thinking about Thomas Kilman and we don't start thinking about the model. We just launch ahead. So my strong suggestion to you would be that if plan A doesn't work, then try plan B or even C or perhaps even D. Let me give you an example. Let's say that two people in your team are having an altercation and you're working in an open office environment and you rationalise that they are two mature adults and they should be able to sort out their own problems and you decide not to get involved in that conflict, hoping, of course, that they can resolve the problem. So you're starting from a base of avoiding. So you're not avoiding, you're avoiding it because you believe that those two people can sort it out. But a few minutes pass and they're still at loggerheads. And in fact, the volume is quite high and they're disturbing and upsetting other people in the open office environment. So you decide to call those two people aside into a private meeting room or your office. And you really then try to compromise you try, both try and ex get both party, you get both parties to explain their situation and you try and find some middle ground that you think might be applicable in that circumstance. But both of them are very stubborn and they decide to dig their heels in. So you then decide to move to collaboration and you say to the two people, are both of you willing to work with me so we can resolve this because we really can't continue in the way that we're going. And you do that for a little while and find that they're not really interested in collaborating. You then might draw, you know, you then might start competing and you might say, well, look, this is the bottom line. You two have got to work together. This is a team environment. I need you two to be working closely together and you don't need to like each other, but you need to be working with each other. And this is what's going to happen. So effectively, in the one situation I've gone through avoiding, compromising, collaboration, and finally competing. So you can see that by using the full extent of the Thomas Kilman model, you're in a position where you're giving yourself a greater opportunity to resolve a conflict situation um, rather than just using one approach and hoping like anything that it works for you. Okay, so. That's the model. So let's move on and look at the different uses of each style. 
So let's start as I started out with competing. So the question is, when should you use competing as a preferred conflict resolution and negotiation style as a team leader? Well, one approach or one circumstance is where speed and decisiveness are necessary. So where you don't have the luxury of discussion, you don't have the time to discuss things, a decision just has to be made, then probably making that decision would be the right way to go, which of course would be a win-lose situation. So you can do that, of course, when you're in a position of authority, such as a team leader. So that would be one approach where you could use it in matters of urgency. Another time you could use this approach is when the party, uh, when parties refuse to cooperate with you and are trying to take advantage of you. So if other people are trying to take advantage of your goodwill, then it might well be appropriate for you to put your foot down and just say that I'm not budging on this. And for those of you who had a low score on competing, this would be very relevant for you. So this is to stop people taking full advantage of you because of your good nature. Now, a lot of people who have trouble with competing are actually taken advantage of. That's the reality. And they're taken advantage of because people know that if I push a little bit harder, people will cave in and give in to my wishes. So the idea is that occasionally we need to step in and be quite firm and assertive about what we're after. Now, another approach is where you have an unpopular decision. So if a, if a decision that you have to make as a team leader is unpopular, then my strong suggestion for you is to jump in and make the decision. There's no point in sugarcoating it because at the end of the day, people aren't going to like it. So you're perhaps better off just jumping in and making the decision, making the call. In fact, you can even preface it by saying to people, you're not going to like this, but this is the way it's got to be. And I think if you do that, you're better off doing that rather than trying to placate people, sugarcoating it and making it sound a lot better than it actually is. And I think people will in the end, even though not in the short term, they will respect you for jumping in and making that decision and that call. Okay, let's now move to accommodation. Now accommodation, remember, is where you lose and the other person wins, which doesn't sound terribly appealing on the surface. But when would you use this approach? Well, there are a lot of situations. For example, if the relationship is more important than the issue. So when you think about it, if you crash through, then you might damage the relationship with the other person. And as a result of that, you decide to let them win because frankly, the issue isn't as important to you as it is to them. And you, you would feel that the relationship long term is more important. So this would be a classic example of you dealing for, with another team leader. The other team leader uh, you have to work with, you have to cooperate with. So what you do is you decide to let them win in the end. So that would be one approach that, where it would be applicable, where the relationship is more important than the task. Another approach would be that if you've got no hopes of getting your needs met, then you might as well just let go of it. So if the other person is in a very strong position and frankly, you're just banging your head up against a brick wall, it might well be just a case of you just saying you can have it, in, you can have it your way and gain the brownie points for actually accommodating in that situation. So let the other person win because frankly, there's no other choice is a reasonable um, uh, you know, justification for using accommodation. And another approach that you might consider is, look, if it's not very important to you, in other words, at the end of the day, um, it doesn't make, mean much to you with all of the things that are on your plate, then just let go and let the other person win. Because frankly, so if you, for example, said to somebody, let's agree to disagree, that would be an accommodation statement. So in other words, you, you're accepting the fact that they disagree with you, with you 
and you just let go in that situation. All right, so let's move to avoiding and think about when you could use avoiding. And a lot of people think, oh, well, I don't think avoiding is a very good way of dealing with conflict. Well, it's very good in certain situations. Let's have a look at them. One particular approach of using avoiding is when diplomacy can help smooth this, this, the situation. So in a situation where you've got to be tactful and diplomatic, um, it's probably worthwhile not saying anything. So for example, if you're in a meeting with your colleagues and someone makes a statement that's not completely accurate, but the reality is by you correcting them, it would take the whole conversation off on another tangent that you don't really want to go down. Sometimes it's best just to bite your tongue until it bleeds and let the person, uh, and, and just don't say anything because you're there for other reasons other than to correct the person when they might be making a minor, minor uh, mistake in terms of their accuracy. So you decide not to say anything and that would be a reasonable approach in those circumstances, provided of course it wasn't serious. I mean, it was a major uh, mistake that had a huge impact on the conversation that you're having, then you'd have a responsibility of course to correct them. When you want to put off a decision until a better time when people have calmed down would be a reasonable use of avoidance. So if somebody's hot under the collar and they're quite upset and emotional at the time, it might be best just for you to let go of it for the time being and come back and revisit it at a more appropriate time when the person is a little bit more uh, objective and rational about the situation. So this is a very good uh, way of being able to uh, still maintain control in a conflict or negotiation situation to come back at a better time. So that would be a reasonable use of avoiding. Now, obviously, if the relationship or the issue isn't important, so neither the, you know, your relationship with the person nor this issue is important, then don't get involved in that bum fight. There's no point. There's enough things to deal with in the workplace to worry about than to have to worry about winning every single argument. So it's best just to let it go. We've all got enough on our plate. And as the old saying says, pick your battles. So pick the battles that are relevant for you um, is, is, is critically important in those circumstances. So you can see there's a good case for avoiding. There's plenty of opportunities to do that. Another last one before we move on is when you need to know more before taking action. Now, in these circumstances, let's say a customer or a client or somebody in another team, a stakeholder, basically um, uh, blindsides you by asking you for your opinion or they uh, want you to give them some information that you're not privy to right there and then, it might well be a good opportunity for you to say, leave it with me, I'll check it out and I'll get back to you as soon as I know. And that way you're buying yourself time. So you're avoiding it initially, but you're going back to that person later with the information that you need. So um, it's not avoiding it completely, but it's avoiding it initially so that you can gain some more understanding and information before you give that person your opinion. So if you're bailed up in a corridor, for example, and somebody wants to know something, and you're thinking to yourself, I'm being put on the spot here, then it's probably best to use avoiding, is to say to the other person, leave it with me, I need to think it through carefully, I'll come back to you when I've given it some thought. Now that's a good approach because it allows you that opportunity to think rationally without that person in your face to consider whether or not, you know, that's a good idea or not. So there's some opportunities to avoid. Now, when would you use collaboration? Remember, we said before that where you've got the time and the energy and the inclination, collaboration is a great approach for dealing with conflict. But its great downfall, of course, is the fact that you do need time because you've got to explore with the other person or persons 
their perspective before you can really collaborate. And that will take up and soak up considerable time. And we don't always have that. So one approach where you could use this is where the situation, not only is the issue important, but the relationship is important as well. So you've got to continually work with this person, but not only have you got to work with them, the issue has to be dealt with. So in those circumstances where there might be you with one other person who might be at an equal level with you in the organisation, such as another team leader, it might well be your opportunity to say to the other person, how about we talk this through to see if we can come up with a resolution that we're both happy with. And of course, that puts the other person on notice that you're willing to collaborate with them to come up with a resolution. But you can only do that, of course, if you've got the time and the other person's got the inclination to do that as well. Another time when you could use collaboration is when the outcome, uh, when an outcome that satisfies both parties sought. So if both parties in the conflict or the negotiation have a vested interest in resolving the issue, then it's likely that that's a good prerequisite for collaboration because both parties are willing to resolve whatever it is that they need to resolve. So obviously you can then put it to them that it's probably worth discussing this so that we can both come to a resolution. Another time when this is very useful is when all parties need to be committed to a solution, like I've sort of mentioned. There is a motivation to resolve this, and therefore, because there's a motivation to resolve it, um, there's perhaps a willingness to discuss how we might go about this and what might be the best course of action. So that would be a useful approach as well. And finally, um, when you've got to come up with a left field solution or a creative solution, this is a very useful approach. And of course, um, you know, coming up with a way forward, perhaps there's no precedent, there is no process in place. And so we've got a blue sky situation with the other party and we've got to sit down and discuss how we might move forward. Well, that would be a classic case of collaboration. And sometimes what happens in those circumstances is that you come up with an even better result because you're willing to talk it through with the other person or persons. So you can see that collaboration has some great benefits, provided, of course, you have the time to collaborate. So let's move on to compromising, which is the last of the five approaches. Now, compromising probably in most situations in the workplace is considered to be the acceptable way of dealing with conflict, but it's not relevant in all situations. And if you had a relatively high score in compromising, you may be sort of deluded into believing that compromising is the only way. Well, it's not. It's one of five ways. So let's look at when you could use it. One of the things that one of the times when you could use compromising is when time's running out and decisions have to be made. So it may be, for example, that you're collaborating with someone and you realise that time is running out and we need to make some serious decisions. So with a time barrier, you might then cut your losses and think about some sort of shortcuts about what you might give up. And, and, and urge the other person to think about some of the shortcuts and what they might give up as well, because you've got a deadline that's got to be met and a resolution has to be met. You could also use this and, and make a pledge with the other person to come back and compromise, it'll, uh, collaborate at another date, another time. Sometimes it can be used, as I mentioned there, when collaboration or competing have failed. So you could start off, start off by competing, you could start off by collaboration, and if that doesn't work, then you can move to that middle area of compromise. It, it can be a temporary solution, and maybe it's not a long-term solution, but it could be a temporary solution to make sure that you're getting the results that you need in the early stages. And then, of course, you can come back at another time. Sometimes compromising is the only way, 
And because it's the only way, an acceptable way, and, and certainly our culture and society will often um, overvalue the use of compromise. And if there is a convention that we need to discuss this and come to a middle ground, then obviously you just get on and do that. All right. So you can see that there is, um, you've got five options basically. It, and, and remember three particular um, variables. There's your preferences, there are the preferences of the other people, and of course there is the situation that you're in as well. And all three of those are critically important. Now, this very busy slide that you're looking at, you'll note that, um, I'm not going to run through it all with you, you can read this at a later date, but you'll notice that there are some advantages and disadvantages of each of the approaches. So in other words, what this means is that there's no one style fits all. And you've got to be aware of what the advantages and disadvantages are. And so if you overuse any of these conflict resolution styles, it's likely that you won't be as anywhere near as effective as you would be if you were using all five. So um, you can have a look at that at your leisure later on. You'll notice over on the bottom, incidentally, it says evading rather than avoiding, but it means exactly the same thing in this case. All right, now what I want to do now is give you a chance to um, type in your answer for these cases. So as I mentioned before, we're going to run through a couple of cases. So here's the first one. Now what I want you to do is, I'm going to read it out to you, and then I want you to type in which one of these would you use. Would you use competing, collaboration, compromise, avoiding, or accommodation? Now, they're fairly general, but I've tried to keep them as practical as we possibly can. So here we go. A customer calls, and they want you to handle an order for him. Okay, so they call you, they've got a relationship with you, you no longer work in that team and it would create a major problem internally if you cross departments. However, the customer who orders a moderate amount of product has been very insistent with you. All right, so this person who clearly is a valued customer, they've been dealing with you in the past, the situation has changed. So which of those five approaches do you think would be the most relevant put in that posi position? So just type in your answers. I'll be keen to see what you come up with. So um, if you could just type in, would you use competing? Would you use collaboration? Would you use compromise? Would you use avoiding? Or would you use accommodation? Keen to hear. Okay, um, William says, um, accommodation. Now, I can understand what you're saying there, William. What you're basically saying is that the customer's always right, or, you know, they are a customer, you need to deal with it at the coal face. The problem, of course, with that approach is that if you use an accommodation approach, in other words, just take the order and deal with the consequences later, What's likely to happen is that you're going to create some problems internally. Not only is it, are you going to create some problems internally, you're also going to create a situation where that customer will probably come back to you the next time, because remember, they're a reasonably important customer. And because they come back to you the next time, they're expecting you to give them the same treatment. So it puts you into a very difficult position uh, with your customer where you um, basically, um, you're training them to come to you no matter what. So in the end, when you say no to this customer, it's going to disappoint them at some point. Anyone else like to have a, a shot at that? Okay, we've got uh, uh, Julene who says um, compromise. Okay. Compromise might work. What you might say to the other person, well, it's a bit difficult to compromise really, isn't it, in this situation? I mean, I think perhaps the best approach might be collaboration. So what you might say to the customer is, 
Um, look, I'll do. Look, what I'll do is I will introduce you to the key person in another team, and once you once I've made that introduction to you, you can deal with them directly. All right. So you're actually collaborating, and in and so you're going to go out of your way to make that introduction. You're going to talk to the person. You're going to go out of your way to do that. I think what Julian you're referring to there is that you might consider um, initially taking the order, and then saying to the person, um, in future I'm going to need you to talk to Mary or Fred or whoever it is in another team because they're the ones that now handle that order. So I think that would work. Competing is not a good approach because obviously if you're competing, you're telling the person that you're not going to help them and that you can find the solution somewhere else. Well, that's not really a very effective approach because you're probably going to annoy the customer and uh, you're not doing them any help. You're not giving them any help either. You can't avoid it. That's for sure. And the reason you can't avoid it is simply that they're talking to you. So you can't really avoid it. You've got to deal with it right there and then. All right. So let's look at the second one. So that's scenario number one. Here's another one. What would you do in this situation? Again, I want you to type in your result once you've read the case. Let's have a look at it. You've had your car in for, for repair. And although the, the Although the claim, they claim it's fixed, you've got the same problem. It's not a regular fault and it's obvious. You paid your bill when you collected the car and you're not, pay, not prepared to pay any more. They're the only dealer that is all convenient to you and you want your car fixed properly now. So what do you do? So just type in your response. So how might you deal with that situation? Would you compete? Would you compromise? Would you collaborate? Would you avoid or would you accommodate? So just wait for everyone to get their responses in to that question. Okay, let's have a look. Now, um, Brendan says compete. Okay, let's have a look at that. Could you compete in this situation? I think you could. Absolutely. Now, why would you compete? Well, you're in the right. You may not be a mechanic, but you understand that the situation that you have dealt with, we've all been in this situation, haven't we? The thing that you have dealt with has, has not been resolved to your satisfaction. You paid your money and you want it fixed. Now, when you say, Brendan, compete, that doesn't mean you, agree, you, you necessarily aggressively go in you don't have, it's not about being aggressive. You might just simply say to the person firmly and assertively, I've paid my money, I'd like my car fixed, please. When can you make sure that it's fixed? Because I've paid my bill and I need my car back as soon as possible. That would be competing. All right, so you can't really avoid this, can you? I mean, where, you can't possibly say to the other person, um, Oh well, say nothing to the other person. You have to get, you have to do something. Now, accommodation obviously isn't ideal because obviously you've paid your money and frankly you you need your car fixed and you need it fixed now. So that's not going to be very useful. Uh, and I I don't you you there there is a there is a possibility of collaboration, um, depending on how you know what it is that's gone wrong and, and uh, all the rest of it. But frankly, I think, Brendan, you're right. I think it is actually competing in that circumstance because um, you're actually in the right and you've done the right thing. Not that you think you're right. You actually, you are right. Okay, moving on to the next scenario. All right, this is scenario number three. Let's have a look at how you might deal with this. So you have a, um, you're, you are a manager of a team that currently has a manual recording system and your analysis, analysis shows greater productivity if it's automated. 
Now, Susan Jones runs the same kind of operation in another team. She disagrees with your proposition, citing customer concerns and employee resistance, plus technical problems with the system you are proposing. But your manager has told you to resolve the situation with Susan because you both must run the same way. So clearly, you must both run the same way and you need to resolve it. So we know that. But you and Susan, who incidentally are on equal terms in the organisation, um, have to come to a resolution. So just type in, how might you deal with that? Anyone like to type in, how would you deal with that situation? Would you compete? Would you collaborate? Would you compromise? Would you avoid? Or would you accommodate? Which of those would you choose? Just give everyone a chance to type in their responses. Okay. All right. Um, Jamie says that he would compromise. Um, I think I can understand what you're getting at, Jamie, but let's have a look at the situation. The situation is that it's either uh, automated or manual. So compromising is difficult. You don't want a system that's half automated and half manual. Now you're both using different systems. I think I'd be inclined to collaborate. So I'd probably get together with Susan and try and work through how we might go about this. And one of the ways forward might be that for the first two weeks, you might use your system. And for the second two weeks, you might use her system. And then after four weeks, you compare notes and make a decision about which of the approaches is actually the better approach. That's probably the best way. You can't really compete in the sense that Susan's on an equal footing with you and is just as adamant that her approach is as applicable as your approach. So it's very hard for you to do that. You can't avoid it because the manager obviously wants you to fix it. Um, it's probably not a good idea to accommodate because your system in actual fact may well be a better system. So you're actually doing your team a disadvantage or a disservice by not exploring that. You can compromise perhaps, but I think it's difficult to compromise when a situation is either automated or manual. So I do think that collaboration is the better approach there. Okay, situation four. This one is more common than we'd probably like to think. Let's have a look at it. So your boss has a personal dislike for one of your team and is insisting you fire that person. While you recognise some occasional problems, you can manage that quite easily. And that person is, in fact, important to the team output. So how do you deal with that? So just type in, what would you do? So your boss is putting pressure on you not to renew somebody's contract. You're working with this person and they have a personal dislike to them. So how might you go about dealing with that? Would you compete? Would you collaborate? Would you compromise? Would you avoid or would you accommodate? Okay, we've got a lot of different answers here and I suspect that it would depend very much on the circumstances you're in. Um, Julie says that she would compete. Okay, I get that. So you probably firmly say to your boss, it depends on your relationship, obviously, the boss. And it depends on how much of a personal dislike this person has. But you might say to your boss, um, this person's actually very valuable to the team. And whilst I acknowledge that occasionally he can be a bit of a pain that you know what, the reality is he's still very valuable to our team output and leave it at that and see what the boss says. So that's competing. Um, there is a case for avoiding. Some of you have mentioned that. Well, how could you avoid? Well, 
how about it, this might be done in a very casual or ad hoc ad hoc way in a car or somewhere and you're not really all that convinced that the boss really means this in other words you need them to say it a second time before you take action so you might just put it in the too hard basket and wait to see what happens um, it's not a good idea to accommodate and I notice that uh, none of you have indicated that and the reason for that is very simple obviously if you give in to the wishes of your boss then the rest of your team are probably going to be very upset with you and probably rationalize and think to themselves what is he or she saying about me when my back's turned because clearly they weren't prepared to stand up for Fred and so your trust level in your team is going to go down dramatically as a result of that action um, you may collaborate in certain situations where out of sight out of mind you move them to another shift or um, there's something around that that might work for you as well okay the final one and then we're done for today number five again I want you to indicate which of these five you would use as a manager you want to design a new system in a way that suits you your approach at the managers meeting is to raise it with the other managers who are all affected by the proposed new change or system one of the other managers says it's too costly that way and that each manager should simply offer their approach and the general manager make the decision all right so someone's challenging you at the meeting that um, the manager should ultimately make the decision so clearly what they're doing is accommodating and your response to that would be what so just type in would you compete collaborate compromise avoid or accommodate uh, or yeah or accommodate so which of those would be most likely to be the right response in those circumstances okay we've got quite a few results here some people say accommodation uh, sorry some people say collaboration and I I can get that so you might say to the other person look let's just try and resolve this ourselves as a team and if we can't come to a resolution then we'll let the boss know and that he or she can make the ultimate decision because we couldn't come to a resolution so that would be a reasonable approach in those circumstances um, I can't really see how you compete um, you can't really avoid it because you've got to deal with it I don't think accommodation is the right approach because at the end of the day your boss is probably not going to be all that happy that you didn't make any attempt whatsoever to resolve this yourself before you came back to him or her so I think there would be an onus on you to try and do what you could to try to resolve this problem before you got your boss involved I think that's probably a fair and reasonable way of dealing with it all right so folks there's some scenarios we're towards the end now and um, I've got a, a couple of key messages for you and a little bit of homework to do I mean ultimately what we're trying to do today is to be flexible so what I want you to do is go out of this broadcast and start to try different approaches to conflict you've been given five ways of dealing with conflict so the important point is if plan A doesn't work try plan B or C or whatever now try not to overuse your preferred style the whole idea is that your preferred style is your blind spot one that you probably overuse and as I said before if plan A doesn't work then go on and do plan B C D and so forth so your homework now is to practice using these five approaches so what I want you to do is to go away and practice using them try to get used to the whole idea of avoiding get used to the idea of accommodation get used to the idea of compromising get used to the idea of competing and get used to the idea of collaboration and so that if I went up to any of your team members and said which 
of these five styles do you think your team leader uses? The answer that you want is actually, well, you know what? He or she uses all five depending on the circumstances. That would be a positive answer and that would be the answer you want to hear. All right, so go away and practice those. Next time we meet in a fortnight, we're going to look at team development or developing a team culture. And that's a very interesting topic because all teams have a culture, whether we like it or not. So until then, I look forward to uh, seeing you. And uh, I would suggest to you now to go out and use conflict to the best of your ability. So thanks everyone and uh, I wish you all a very uh, happy new year and have a wonderful um, weekend. Thank you and goodbye.